path of advocacy and involvement in the LifePoy network, a survivor support program for tra trafficked women here in New York, where I've been privileged to be involved with for around four years now. Today, you'll be hearing from people who inspire me at the front lines of the anti-trafficking movement. I hope you will walk away from this session with two things. The first, a deeper understanding from the people who inspire me, and that you can go on to raise awareness in your own communities. Second, a clear picture of what is being done to protect children from the unthinkable trauma of sexual abuse and exploitation, and what you can do in your own right to help. To respect your time, we will adhere strictly to the time constraint of 30 minutes. There will be three short presentations followed by a 10 minute Q&A session. We encourage you to put questions in the Q&A box. If your question is not answered during the session, one of us will get in touch with you afterwards to answer it directly. There are also some links in there now, which I encourage you all to save before they disappear. I'll remind you one more time at the end. Finally, I'd like to issue a content warning. The following presentations include disturbing descriptions and images of child sexual abuse. Now I hand over to Luke, the director of RISE, to give you a data-driven snapshot of the issue. Thank you very much indeed, Nikki, and a particular thanks from Arise for your constancy in support of this issue, with your advocacy and your tremendous support for LifeWay Network in New York. First of all, a word about Arise. We're focused on preventing exploitation, turning off the tap so that people don't have to suffer the devastating consequences of these appalling crimes. We began our work in the Philippines back in 2015, and we opened an office in Dagopan at the end of 2020. The way that we work is to be led by frontline organizations and their networks. We aspire to serve them. At Arise, we believe that slavery and human trafficking in the Philippines is inextricable from the broader issues of poverty, inequality, the remittance economy, and so many other factors. You will hear later about how any prevention effort must be broad and cannot be limited to addressing the consequences of just one form of exploitation. Preventing child sexual exploitation in the Philippines is just one of the issues that the superb frontline networks working in the area are confronting. And we take this moment to applaud the dozens of Filipino organizations who are on this call who are doing this life-changing work. But today's short session is about raising awareness about one of those forms, online child exploitation, which has experienced an unprecedented rise during COVID-19. So, what do we know about it? Well, first of all, let's define it. Online child sexual exploitation, or OSEC, is the production of online content showing the sexual abuse or exploitation of a minor which is published or shared. Why this focus on the Philippines when every country has this issue? Well, yes, they do. But there is worrying data from the Philippines. According to global law enforcement data, the Philippines is the largest known source of OSEC cases in the world. Between 2014 and 2017, the number of IP addresses used for OSEC in the Philippines more than tripled to 149 per 10,000 IP addresses. During the pandemic, globally, the demand for OSEC material has increased dramatically whereby Q detected a 200% increase in posts on sex abuse forums between February and March in 2020. On the 25th of May 2020, the Philippines Department of Justice confirmed a 264% increase in OSEC reports during that period of school closures, which they attributed mainly to higher internet usage. To make matters worse, there's been an 89% decrease in the number of URLs removed after child sexual exploitation content was detected on, partly due to resources being redirected to tackling COVID-19 and the limitations of remote working. So who is targeted by these appalling crimes? It's 83% female, about 17% male, with the average age 
just being 11 years old. And what's driving this trade? Typically, it's older Western men, English speaking often, employed, educated with no criminal history. The estimates are that 39% of that constituency had traveled to the Philippines previously. And who is doing the trafficking? Well, according to International Justice Mission, and we're privileged to have them on this call as well, more than 83% of cases of online child sexual exploitation in the Philippines are carried out by family members, indicating that OSEC has embedded itself within households and communities. How can we possibly hope to change this? Families abusing their own children. Just pause for a second to imagine how desperate you'd have to be to consider abusing your own child to get by. One thing is for sure, responding requires a comprehensive and we believe grassroots approach, one embedded in communities. It requires providing viable alternatives to high risk groups. It requires awareness raising, provision of education, skills development, and the provision of safe employment and safe migration pathways. There is no silver bullet. But working together, patiently, building resilience in collaboration will, we believe, make a huge difference. And work like this is already underway, led by many of the amazing Filipino organizations on this call. Today, we're hearing from two people contributing to the Filipino anti-slavery movement, uh, Victor Julian and Cecilia Urbana. Cecilia will be introduced by Victor, so I'm just going to introduce him. Victor's work at Ted is on is very well known, especially through the uh, computer animated child sweeting, which was used in sting operations for uh, online sex predators. Uh, this technology is world renowned. Victor masterfully leveraged that technology to target the demand side of OSEC. But through this work in the Philippines with local NGOs, it, he has been led to uh, address the supply side to working in prevention and source communities. So it's my real pleasure to introduce you, Victor, over to you. Thank you, Nikki and Luke, for this introduction. And it's a real privilege to be part of the special event. Not only the broad audience will be reached, but also survivors of online exploitation with all your support. And that's what you give them with this event. So many thanks that you stand up for them. So, do you remember Sweden, the Filipino girl who went online and talked to men in front of a webcam? What you probably, probably didn't know, but I was for several years the so-called operator of Sweden. And to make it more concrete, with the use of the Swedish software, I checked on a daily basis with those men. So let, let me tell you a little bit about this experience and the things I've learned about it. So first of all, when Sweden was revealed to the public, it led to a massive increase in awareness about OSEP. Sweden was prime news in dozens of newspapers and it was seen in all primary broadcasting stations. We never expected this. So the use of IT tools in this field generates, besides concrete results, a raise in awareness, and that's of great value. Secondly, when I deployed Sweetie, I was in shock. Thanks to this shock software, we get a view of the scale of our state. It was unbelievable. The moment I went online and dropped Sweetie in the chat box, of in, uh, in Fora, Dozens of men started to chat with me. And believe me, those chats are not about the way. And last but not least, we were able to identify some of those men. And we tried to hand over this information to law enforcement. And this process, however, is the most complicated and comprehensive part of the job. I don't have time to share all findings with you now, but one of them is that law enforcement is worried if OSEP cases. And as a former police officer told me once, you cannot simply arrest your way out of this problem. And even if there was an arrest, this would not mean that the child was rescued too. So we needed to expand our activities. And we call it with our so called boots on the ground. And our goal find those children so we can get them out, but also obtain more information about the perpetrators or customers, as they call them, or as they are called. This meant going to the Philippines and operating streets and neighborhoods. And during this phase, we met our dear friend Cecilia and a remarkable organization for Free, which will come after. 
And it's really actually to an important element. If you want to have real success, collaboration with local partners is crucial. Grassroots organizations like the one of Cecilia, or for instance, the Prayer Foundation of Father Shea, they have the knowledge, the network, and the long and standing experience of the field. And this helps outsiders like us tremendously in operating success, successfully, but also safely in the Philippines. So, nowadays, my time as an operator of Sweetie has ended. But my drive and passion for standing up for his children has not. And with the lessons we have learned, we started this new foundation, which is called Underground Child Foundation. And we now build a gate again in tackling OSA. So, why is it? So, one of the reasons is that until now, most survivors and victims have remained invisible. They told us, however, that they want you to know about their experience, their struggle, and also their resilience. Their voices must be heard. And their stories must be told. So we want them back above ground. Our mode of work also changed. We still use online investigators to operate in the online mode. Only this time we not only focus on the perpetrators, but we also focus on the facilitators. And by interacting with them, we will get a global location or area where these children are involved in OSEC. And combining these online skills with our field skills, we then will successfully find and identify those children. As mentioned, rescuing these children by the law enforcement takes time. But unfortunately, it's not always the next best step. A rescue can be very traumatic. A better solution is to empower those children so that they can, so that they can get out of this chain of abuse by themselves. So how will we do that? In short, we create a safe environment for these children where they can develop their own skills. Call this an exclusive academy where they not only enhance their skills, but where they also will be guided directly to companies, institutions, and other organizations. Then there is no need for these children to be involved in OSI anymore. And for us, this process, of course, we need you to. So, our formula is rather simple. Use IT technology and combine it with our field activities and focus on the job. Prevention is key, Borger. By doing so, we will break the chain of views. And I'm running out of time already. So I want to hand it over to Cecilia. She will tell you all about the, the voice of the free and the children itself. But I want you to leave with this quote, which inspires me from time to work. Get up, stand up, speak up, and do something. And I think this is time to do it, and together we can really work that. Thank you. Up to you, Cecilia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dick. Um, my name is Cecilia Oibanda Parasis. I'm the founder of the Voice of the Free. DF is a grassroots organization based in the Philippines. And for, for three decades, we have been in the front line in protecting victims and vulnerable individuals against human trafficking. We also operate strategic uh, um, transit area like ports and airports. We have a shelter for survivors called the Center of Hope for Girls that provide holistic healing and transformative care. We also provide education, career preparation, and, and entrepreneurial skills. We really try hard to empower survivors to become resilient individuals towards the productive reintegration. I met Dector and his team three years ago when they were tracking traffickers that abuse a group of girls that are staying in our shelter. The girls are composed of one year old five-year-old, seven-year-old, 12, six, and 16. All are victims of online sexual exploitation. Traffickers of these girls are coming from different parts of the world, and they, they are not contented to abuse them online. They also come to Manila and physically abuse the girls. With the information from the girls, and because of their courage and bravery to give their testimony 
and with the help of Victor's team and other partners from government, law enforcers, were able to track down the perpetrators and bring them to justice. This is not the only group for a victims of us and for staying in our shelter. We have more girls who are also in the same age. We have two, we have four, we have eight years old girls. And a lot of them, that their parents and their relatives are the pimps and help facilitation of the abuse. Many of their parents and relatives believe that online expectations exploitation does, doesn't do any harm to the kids because there is no direct physical contact. Of course, we know that it's not the reality. So this, this is the pictures of the girls, actual girls that we stay with us in the shelters. And the other one is one year old, the, and the girl in the group uh, dress is queen or so. While I consider myself a veteran in handling different kinds of trafficking cases, but I must admit that these cases shake me to my core. It's really devastated me and my team, and it's really broke our heart. How can these innocent babies and children experience this pure evil at a very young age? Today, during this pandemic, the pandemic already displaced an estimate of 4 million local Filipino workers and around 550,000 overseas Filipino workers lost their job. We lost billions of pesos of remittances from all migrant workers and this put millions of family, family in desperation and extreme poverty. The continuing lockdown magnified the pre-existing problems of human trafficking that fuels online sex exploitation. Cases are increasing every day and online predators are developing new ways to deceive young people. During the first wave of the pandemic lockdown, we have 50 girls under our care at the center of hope. Like other NGO, we struggle to make the shelter safe and secure. Logistical needs are very, very difficult. Our social workers and certain teams have to be locked down with the girls for months. And you can imagine the sacrifices that they have to undergo, especially if they have their own family. On the top of that, calls for help from the newly reintegrated survivors are also locked down in their communities are increasing every day. We need to respond to their needs quickly because they might slide back again to the trafficking, to the same trafficking situation. Hotline calls for help is also keep on coming, not only from the communities, but also from the overseas workers stranded at the airports. With the continuous surge of Corona cases in the Philippines, we are bracing ourselves for the worst scenario. We believe that because of this crisis that we are facing, no single NGO or institution or even the government can effectively address human trafficking, which become more complicated. We cannot deal with the problem in isolation anymore. It is so intertwined with health issue, extreme poverty, loss of income, um, hunger, human rights, and other social issues. We need a stronger collaboration from multi-stakeholder partners, from the church, civil society, corporate partners, and government. We need to find ways to complement our efforts given the limited resources that we have to make sure that our children are safe as we face this crisis. We in Voice of the Free understand that it's equally important to focus on prevention efforts, especially in equipping, educating young people. During the pandemic, we strengthened our youth movement, which is based on school, church, and communities 
called the I Fight Movement. It is a movement of young people where we partner with local government, religious group, and the de local department of education. Our activities are more possibly online and technology based to create counterculture against online abuses. We believe that empowering the youth, arming them with the right information, also empowered their fam families and their social sector. We need also to intensify our effort in preventing trafficking in poor communities, the increasing family incomes to social enterprise and accessing government services to mitigate economic and cultural vulnerabilities to trafficking. We in the voice of the free were able to create also an online platform called Work Skills Connect. It is a platform where people who lost their job can connect to the government facilities, companies, local businesses to find available jobs. This is in partnership with the local Department of Labor and Trade and Industry and others. During this pandemic, I was sadly to say that many donors shift their resources to address the immediate needs of stopping the pandemic, which I truly understand. But I believe the services and programs for victims of human trafficking are also essential. And anti-trafficking service providers are also frontliners. We need to continue to protect them. We need to continue to save and build life of victims and survivors of human trafficking. The battle against human trafficking is uphill in this new normal. But in God's grace, we find ways to collaborate more, to be bold, to adapt new strategies, and to address the problem of human trafficking, not only in the Philippines, but also in the world. We should not lose hope. We need each other more than ever. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Cecilia. Uh, and it was lovely to see um, uh, just a posting in the chat box from one of our trustees, uh, remembering how much of an inspiration uh, you've been to her. That's uh, Wendy, one of our trustees. And, uh, absolutely, I know that you're an inspiration to so many on the school. Thank you, Cecilia. Okay, we don't have much time for Q&A, so I'm going to launch uh, straight into it. Um, first question comes from Dr. Evelina Ojab, who says, on the 8th of April, we mark the World Day for Child Sexual Abuse Prevention, Healing and Justice. What proactive steps do we need our governments to take to protect children from OSEC, whether occurring abroad or closer to home? But could I just pitch that to you, Cecilia? Could you answer that question first? Well, we need to understand that, of course, the government now is really overwhelmed. And I think that the pandemic really showed the capacity of each government to respond to social issues. But I think we NGOs, we civil society should not stop. And we need to gather and to bring fresh data, fresh narrative in order to continue and to remind them of their commitment to the children and to the public to focus on and immediately address the rising cases of all sectors in the country or anything else, anywhere else. Thank you, Cecilia. And um, Victor, would you add anything to that? You're on mute. Uh, it's difficult to, to mention. There's a lot of things to mention, but I think there are, there are uh, different aspects. For instance, if you look at the online news, uh, files for sharing data, it could be done something in that area, um, more cooperation within law enforcement also, um, and also um, government structures um, at the end, so shelters help each other. So it's it's all of our piece actually, um, and if it be there, it could be done something. But I know it's really generic, but I'm not telling you. It's a lot to change, but basically I think we start with awareness. We should be aware of the impact it has on children, on our youth. Victor, could I also come back to you, because there's a question in the chat box, um, just asking how hard it is to prosecute people who uh, 
perform this kind of abuse, uh, those who consume this kind of abuse, as I said earlier, it tends to be driven from, from the West. I know you've had some experience of securing prosecutions. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, well, I'm not prosecuted, of course, but what I know it's very... Uh, if all my abuse is difficult to prove it, basically, because you can say, uh, you can show the images with somebody downloaded or actually stored or whatever. But it doesn't mean that the person itself is it. So actually what you have to do if you want to have a real good case, have a, a hands-on, but not a hands-on, you have to have you have to have him in the act. So it's very difficult for law enforcement to catch him in the act. And if you have that, then for the prosecution it's much easier. There are many more laws, of course, that if you're in possession of child pornography, you also will be uh, prosecuted. But if you want to have the heavy penalty, you want to be comprehend him when he's doing it. And it's, of course, very difficult. Um, Can I add we, something to that, though, very quickly? Yeah, I think in my experience in prosecution, that it's really very important to invest in the survivors. You know, cases really depend on the testimony and the gathering of evidence. And the role of the survivors, the victims in their testimonies as a witness is very important. And of course, you need a prosecutor who are really on our side. Thanks, Cecilia. Um, there are far too many questions for us to answer, unfortunately, but I, I do promise you that we're going to endeavor to get back to all of you if we don't have time now, which we won't, because we've only got one more minute before I hand back over to Nikki. Um, but I just want, do want to do one more question. This is from Elizabeth Payton of the New York Times, who says, uh, thank you. Um, if online sexual exploitation of minors is embedded in households and communities because of poverty, what can be done to stop it at a time when poverty and inequality are only rising with the fallout of the pandemic? And I'll go to you again to see the funny. I think you're on mute, sorry. Yeah. Well, definitely there is no single cause of OSEC, so there is no also single solution either. So major poverty is a major root cause, but addressing poverty alone is not totally eliminate OSEC. So therefore, it is really very important that it is multiplicit, that it is, uh, you know, in all fields that we can address. But definitely, we need to work on the value systems of the family and parents, they need to understand that their children are not the frontline defense for the, the poverty. We need to work the, you know, the values and give importance to the dignity of the family. We need to increase parents' productivity, financial and economic capacity so that they can find a sustainable livelihood and job so that we're not going to sell their children and never send their children away from home. Improve access to serv uh, services, uh, health and Build the resilience in shafts like typhoons, floods, and even the cockpits. And of course, really, really invest in the young people because the future is for them. And they are the ones who need to fight for the rights. And I, I would just add to that, Sue, from a RISE's perspective, it's not just what you do, it's the way that you do it. And we believe that doing that through people who are embedded within communities who are not going away who are going to stay there and serve and love those communities long term, but we believe is, is a very effective way to try to provide these kinds of interventions. Nikki, I need to hand over to you now to conclude the event. Thanks so much. Thanks. To wrap things up, I'd like to thank Cecilia and Victor for their incredible dedication to this issue. You are remarkable and inspiring. Um, we're going to leave you with a list of concrete actions that you can take to support the movement. Continue to learn about it, share about it, give your time to it, donate, and be an engaged donor. Thank you all for being here. I encourage you to stay in touch with the Arise team and look out for the next of these sessions. Goodbye for now.